We're in the, the book of Amos, and uh, we come to the ninth chapter. It's the last chapter of the book of Amos. We've covered eight chapters before this, and I titled this message, It's Coming. That almost sounds like a disaster movie title, doesn't it? I mean, the, the tornado is coming, the tsunami is coming, the asteroid or the comet that's going to hit the earth and destroy everybody on the planet, it's coming. Isn't that what that title sounds like? Well, it's pretty close. Because he says, destruction is coming. Now listen, he has been warning us from the very first chapter. The second verse says, the Lord roars from Zion. In the third chapter, he tells us, does a lion roar when there is no prey? What he's saying here is that there is impending judgment, destruction coming to Israel. We move to the second chapter. He says, hey, there's fire ahead. He identifies the surrounding nations around Israel, and he says, the Lord is going to send a fire to consume them. Whoa. And the fire is judgment. You move to the fourth chapter. I know I'm skipping some chapters. I don't want to rehearse the whole book all over again. You go to the fourth chapter. Wow, that was a strong amen, too. You go to the fourth chapter, and the warning is, prepare to meet your God. I want to pause for a moment and just ask you right now, this is a question you need to ask yourself, am I prepared to meet Almighty God? Boom, powerful question. We move to the fifth and the sixth chapter, and he's got a series of woe. Woe, he says woe, and his expression is woe, I'm, I'm doomed. I mean, my, by golly, He's been warning, warning, warning the nation Israel. Then last week we saw in the 8th chapter, he said, listen, the nation is ripe for judgment. And I asked just a very simple question. I never gave the answer to it. I said, after outlining how Israel was ripe for judgment, I simply asked, is America ripe for judgment? And you were nodding your heads. You were nodding your heads. That's why we need a spiritual awakening and a spiritual revival because destruction is coming. That's the ninth chapter. He's been warning them, warning them, warning them, warning them. Sign after sign after sign. Hey, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. So if they fall over the cliff, whose fault is it? It's theirs. They've been warned all along. They've been warned all along. It's coming. It's coming, and you cannot escape it. That's how he starts the ninth chapter. He said, I saw the Lord standing at the altar, and he said, strike the top of the pillars. I got a pillar there. It's got the capital at the top. It's got the cross beams on it. If you strike that, he says, strike it so hard that the threshold shakes, the foundation shakes from striking it. Whoa. And bring them down on the heads of all the people. It's like all the nations inside this building and the capital is struck, and it's, it's shaking the foundation, and the whole thing collapses. You remember Samson? He said, lead me to the two supporting pillars. And he got there, and he prayed to the Lord, give him one last burst of energy and strength, and he pushed on those pillars, and the whole place came tumbling down upon the Philistines. He killed more Philistines in that one event than in his whole life. Those who are left, I will kill with the sword. Not one will get away. Not one will escape. Wow, it's coming. Doom, destruction, judgment. And you can't escape it. You cannot hide from it. Though they dig down to the depth of the grave, from there I will, from there my hand will, will, will take them. And though they climb to the, the heavens, from there I will bring them down. Listen, he says, though they hide themselves on the top of Mount Carmel, there I will hunt them down and seize them. Though they hide from me in the bottom of the sea, there I will command the serpent to bite them. Sea serpent. You cannot hide, you cannot escape, you cannot hide this destruction that's coming. You cannot evade it. Though they are driven into exile by the enemies, there I will command the sword to slay them. I will fix my eye upon them for evil. Wow. 
The Bible doesn't teach that God is the author of evil. The concept here of evil is calamity. They're going to have a calamitous end. My eye is fixed upon them because it is coming, and it is not for good. It's not for good. You cannot withstand this destruction that's coming. The Lord, the Lord Almighty, to get that Almighty. You can't withstand the almighty force of God. He who touches the earth and it melts. That's all you got to do, just touch it. And the whole thing melts. And all who live in it mourn and the whole land rises like the Nile. The Nile we saw, saw last week. The Nile will rise 45 feet. That's taller than the top of the building here. Earthquake happens. The land you're on goes up. And the previous chapter says it shakes. And then it comes crashing back down. I don't think any building we made yet will withstand it. He who builds the lofty palace in heaven, that's God, and who sets the foundation on the earth, it says, heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. This God that is so big, so awesome, so fierce, so almighty, he calls for the waters of the sea and he pours them out over the face of the earth. He said, let there be water, and there was. The Lord is his name. The Lord. The Lord. You cannot withstand the almighty Lord. Now, you, you cannot claim privilege, because he knows this is what the Israelites are going to say. Oh, but we're Israelites. Oh, I'm a Christian. Oh, I'm a good person. Oh, I have lots of friends. Oh, I've been baptized. Oh, I gave a lot to the church. I have privilege. He says, are not you Israelites the same to me as the Cushites? Cush is Ethiopia. He said, there's no difference between you and the Ethiopians. What? You see, God doesn't look on the outward appearance. He looks on the heart. He looks on the heart. Did I not bring Israel up from Egypt and the Philistines from Kaptor? <laughs> this is amazing. Kaptor is one of the isles of the Mediterranean Sea. They were called the sea people, these Philistines. And he said, Lord, I brought the Philistines to your land. Just like I brought you to the land. And from Kaptor, I brought the Ar Arameans uh, from Kerr. He says, listen, I'm the one that brings the nations. They're all my people. So don't claim any privilege. It's coming. It's coming. Surely the eye of the sovereign Lord, the eyes of the sovereign Lord, are on the sinful kingdom. Wow. You think maybe his eyes are on America? Ooh. It's even more than that. Not just simply he's on a sinful America, but his eyes are on every one of us and all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the point Amos is making. We're all sinners headed for destruction. Whoa. I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Listen. Listen. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. I'm going to tell you right now, none of us are getting out of this world alive. You can take that to the bank. But I don't know what you're going to do with it after you're gone. The wages of sin is death. Watch. How shall we escape? if we ignore such a great salvation. Let me ask you, he's been telling us here, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. How are you going to escape if you neglect the salvation the Lord has wrought? It is coming. It is coming. It is coming. You cannot overtake it. I don't care what you want to do. With all your energy and effort and might and power, for I will give the command and I will shake the house of Israel among all the nations as grain is shaken in a sieve. I'm going to shake it. I'm going to shake it. 
and I'm going to sprinkle you among the nations. Isn't that what happened to the nation Israel? They got scattered among the whole world. Now the pebble will reach the ground. All the sinners among my people will die by the sword. All those who say, disaster will not overtake us or meet us. What? You think you can overtake it? It is going to overtake you. Hebrew says it appointed unto man once to die. Nobody dies before that appointment. No one dies after that appointment. They make that appointment. Now, you may skip your dentist appointment. You may skip your doctor's appointment. You may skip. You are not skipping that, point, that appointment. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. You cannot overtake it. It is coming. You say, Pastor, this is a message of doom. You're getting it. <laughs> You're actually getting it. It's coming. Destruction is coming. Oh, I love this word. It's the next word in the text. Yet. Now, not every translation translates this word this way. The New Living Translation says, but. And the New American Standard Bible says, nevertheless. And then there's the King James Version that says, saving that. And here's my favorite. It's the English Standard Version. Except, except, there is an exception. What? Destruction is coming, destruction is coming, destruction is coming. That's all he's been crying out through the whole book. And then he says, except, here it is, yet I will not totally destroy the house of Jacob. I am going to spare, I'm going to save, I'm going to have a remnant a small group, a remnant. A, a, there's this big piece, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save a little remnant. I'm going to save that remnant out of all those people that deserve destruction. I will not totally destroy the house of Jacob. So how can you be saved from it? Well, it's very simple. Amos says, restoration is coming. Not only is destruction coming, restoration is coming. God is going to do that. It's needed. It's so needed. In that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. Now, David was the first king of Israel. Okay, he's the king of Israel. Saul was, but he was a wicked king. And, and then David was a, the good king. And, and God made a promise to David that he would establish his throne and his house forever. And that is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ because he is of the seed of David. And he is the king of all kings and lord of all lords. But it needs to be restored because David's kingdom was divided and split after him. The northern ten tribes became the nation Israel. The southern two tribes became the nation of Judah. It got split. Amos is preaching to that northern group, but he's from the south. And he's saying, you're, you're doomed. You're headed for destruction. You, the tent of David is collapsing. I feel sorry for this poor guy in that tent. <laughs> It's fallen down upon him. And that's what he's been saying. It's needed because the tent has fallen. The nation Israel, the northern kingdom, went into captivity, captivity by Assyria in 722 B.C. The southern kingdom, through Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, in 586 B.C. They were carried away. The tent collapsed. It was gone. No more kings. No more kings. They never had another king until King Jesus arrived. The tent was fallen. Here he describes, it needs to be restored. I will repair its broken places. Now, this translation puts tent. Tent's kind of a fluid word. It could mean a hut. It could mean like a lean tune. <laughs> But here he's going to repair it. It really means he's going to wall it up. He's going to put walls back. He's going to fix the walls. The walls are down. And he's going to put them back up. The Lord, Lord's going to restore. He's going to wall it up. He's going to restore it. And that means to literally to raise it up. He's going to raise it back up. These are all synonyms. He's going to raise up its ruins. He's going to take out of the nation Israel. He's going to rebuild the nation Israel. And that's his next term. He will build it up. He's going to build it up. Wall it up, build it up. He's going to restore it. And notice what it says here, as it used to be. 
That means a nation with a king that uh, Israel hasn't had in years. Okay? It's going to have a king, and it's going to be restored to the way it used to be when David was king. He's going to rule over the whole kingdom. He's talking about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, who's going to set up his, his kingdom upon the earth, and he's going to reign over a literal Israel with real territory, real subjects, and a real king. And here's what it says next. So there's a purpose for all of this. God's going to restore his people, Israel, for a purpose that they may possess the remnant of Edom. Now, Edom was Esau. Esau was Jacob's brother and became his arch enemy. Over time, these nations fought. And it says, so that they may possess the remnants of Edom, the remnant, those that are that small group of people out of Edom that God's going to call, and all the nations. Now, listen, right, let me go. Right now, Israel is dominated by the Gentile powers of the world. It is. The only real ally Israel has is the United States of America. Isn't that right? We're about the only, and sometimes our loyalty wavers. The day is coming, though, when this text says Israel will possess all the nations of the earth. Why? Because King Jesus is going to rule from Jerusalem over the whole planet, and all the nations are going to bring their wealth unto Jerusalem because King Jesus is going to reign. And so they will possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. When? Well, here. In that day when the Lord restores Israel. Do you know the Lord has begun restoring Israel? 1948. Nation was reincorporated. People have been trickling back. The Jews have been trickling back since then. The days are coming, though. They're still in the future. It's coming. This is a future prediction. It's going to be in the day when the reaper will over, be overtaken by the plowman. So the guy that is reaping, taking in the harvest, he looks behind him and there's a guy planting already because it's so much crop, so much harvest has been taken in. There's been so much blessing and bounty that he's overtaken by the planter. He's being overrun. What he's, what he's talking about is this is going to be a time of great prosperity such as the world has never known. And that's when King Jesus rules here on planet Earth, when he comes again. He says, uh, the planter will be overtaken by the one treading the grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains, will flow all through the hills. A time of restoration and blessing is coming to the nation. And I will bring back my exiled people. Oh, it started in 1948 and it's still going on today. The Jews have been scattered throughout the whole earth or migrating back, migrating back, migrating back. And they will rebuild and, and the ruined cities and they will live in them and they will plant vineyards and they will drink their wine and they will make gardens and eat their fruit. God is bringing his people back. That's the heart of this whole thing. God is going to restore the nation so that King Jesus rules. And he says, and I will plant Israel in their own land. They're going all back to Israel. Never again to be uprooted from the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. There is a restoration coming. Who's restored? Ah, the remnant of Israel. Yet, I will not totally destroy the house of Jacob. There will be a small remnant who will be saved. There's also going to be a remnant among the nations so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and also all the nations that bear my name. All the nations. All the nations. In the New Testament, it says this. I love this passage. So too, at the present time, Paul's writing. I think it's still true today. At the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. Chosen by grace. Grace is what you don't deserve, and you're given it anyway. You can't add to it, you can't take from it. Listen, if it is by grace, it's a gift. And that's why I got the picture of a gift there. Grace means it's a gift. It's freely given to you. There's no strings attached. It is just given to you. 
You can't work for it. You can't deserve it. In fact, he says, and if it's by grace, then it's no longer by works. If it were, if it were by works, then grace would no longer be grace. If I were to take my Bible off the front pew and say, hey, here, you can have this for free. It's a gift from me to you. And then you say, well, wait a minute. That's, got, that's a pretty nice Bible. That's probably worth 80 bucks, maybe 100. Let me give you a dollar for it. If I accepted that dollar, it would no longer be a gift. It would have been a bargain. It would have been a bargain. And you could go brag on how you really got a good deal in fact, you really put it to the preacher. You got an $80 Bible for a buck. God does not want you to brag. You cannot do anything. You cannot escape the judgment by doing anything on your own. You cannot escape this destruction by doing anything on your own. The escape plan is a gift from God, purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, on the cross, taking our debt taking our sin, paying the price to buy the gift to give to you freely. This matter came up at the Jerusalem Council, Acts chapter 15. Early church gathers together because they got a problem. The Pharisees, right-wing extremists in the religious party of the Jews, stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to obey the law of Moses in order to be Christians. They've got to convert to Judaism. They've got to do these ceremonial works. It's kind of like saying today, you've got to be baptized to become a Christian. You've got to be a church member to get to heaven. No, it's not true. It's not true. But that's what they were trying to impose upon the Gentile believers who came to faith. Now watch this. Watch this. Peter addressed them. He says, no, you got it wrong. We believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved. Not by keeping the law. Not by circumcision. Not by baptism. Not by church membership. Not by giving offering. Not by being a good person. No, it's, it's a gift from Jesus because he bought the gift on the cross with his blood. He owns the gift. He gives the gift. He says, no, 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 no. no. We believe that's through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as those Gentiles are. What? He said, no, you see, the law could only curse you and expose your sin. It could never save you. That's all the law does. You break a commandment, what was the consequences? You die. You die. Paul said, I did really good. I kept them all except that one. Thou shalt not covet. All the external things I could take control of, but that, it was my heart. My heart was desperately wicked and evil. He said, I couldn't control it. I was a condemned man. Condemned man. Then Peter adds these words. The words of the prophets are in agreement. Notice he does not say in fulfillment. What he's saying here is, now, I'm going to quote from Amos. I'm going to quote from Amos 9, and they're in agreement with this. Listen to what he says. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this. As it is written, after this I will return and rebuild the fall, David's fallen tent. Its ruins will be rebuilt. It will be restored. And the remnant of men may seek the Lord. What? The remnant of men may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who bear my name. The whole point of this, he's saying... This passage in Amos is an agreement that God has always intended to save a remnant of the Gentiles by grace through faith without the law. Amazing. Because if they're going to be Gentiles in the millennium who never kept the law, then they must have been saved by grace. He's saying if that principle is true, then do not impose good works on people to be saved. Because you are not saved by good works. You're saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that cool? That's what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved. So I got that lifesaver up there. He's throwing it out. Man, you're sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Remember that hymn? You're sinking in your sin. And and, and the Lord Jesus Christ throws the, the, the life ring out. It really shouldn't be a ring. It should be a cross. And you've got to cling to the cross of Jesus. It's by grace that you have been saved 
Through faith. You've got to go through the doorway of faith. It's the only way to take hold on the salvation that God has, to be a part of the remnant, to avoid what is coming, the destruction that is coming. He says, this is not from yourself. You can't produce it. You can't do it. It is the gift of God. That's the only way you can be saved. You don't work for it. You just receive it. You just receive it. You accept it that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You believe in him, that he died on the cross for your sins, so you admit you're a sinner. And you believe that God raised him from the dead. Because when you believe that, the Bible says you were saved by grace through that faith. Then he adds, just so you, don't, you, get, you get this, it's not by any work that you do. That's the hardest part. Everybody wants to save themselves. They say, I'm going to do more, I'm going to do enough good to outweigh my bad. You can't do that much good. It took the death of Jesus Christ to pay for that price. Then he adds a final line so that no one can boast. You cannot brag about being saved. You can't. I can't go around patting myself on the back. Good job, Dan. You believed. It's all a bit of grace. It was a gift that he gave me that I would even believe and be saved. It's all of God. You don't brag. You get burdened for those who are not saved. So what do we learn? What do we learn from this passage in Amos? We learn it's coming. It's coming. Destruction is coming for the wages of death. The wages of sin is death. It's coming, as I said. None of us get out of here alive, and none of us takes anything with us. You've never seen a hearse with a U-Haul trailer behind it. You cannot take anything of your good works with you. You can't. You can't. Restoration, though, is the second part of that verse. You see, the whole Bible is about this. Destruction is coming, but God has made a plan to restore you. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In fact, in Gospel of John, the third chapter, we find a famous verse, John 3, 16. Just a couple verses later, 18, John writes this. Whoever believes in him, Jesus Christ, is not condemned. I love that. But the second part says, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. It's right there. Amos' message it's right there, right there. You go to the end of the chapter and it says this, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. It's a possession. I possess it. I believed as an eight-year-old child. I believed in Jesus Christ as my Savior. I received eternal life. I have it. I have it. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, but the wrath, the wrath God's wrath, remains on him. Wow. Jesus himself says this in the Sermon on the Mount. Enter through the narrow gate. What's the narrow gate? It's the faith gate. Just believing in Jesus as your Savior, making him your personal Savior, admitting you're a sinner, accepting him, and say, Lord, I know that you bled and died, and you took my place. You receive him, you make him your Savior, your Lord. You enter in through that narrow gate, because listen, for wide is the gate of the world. Why is the gate of all the scientists? Why the gate of the political scientists, the politi politicians, you name it? Why is the gate? And broad is the road. And listen, there's many that are on that road and they're going through it and they think, wow, you're really a weirdo. You follow that Jesus. It leads to destruction. Did I tell you it's coming? Destruction is coming. But it doesn't have to be that way. You can accept him today, right where you're at. You can make him Lord. You can go through the doorway of faith, right where you're at, right now. Let's pray. While your heads are bowed and eyes closed, and if you say, you know what, I think I'm on the broad path that's leading to destruction, but I want to be on that narrow one and go through the gate, the narrow one of faith, then you pray to the Lord right now something like this. Lord, 
I know that I'm a sinner and cannot save myself. I believe that Jesus is the Christ who died on the cross to pay in full my sin. I receive him now as my Savior. I accept your gift of eternal life. I believe he is raised from the dead so that he can change my life and give me his eternal life. I accept it. Lord, I know that if anyone prays anything similar to that, means it in their heart, that you will save them. You will give them the gift of your grace, of salvation, and they will have an assurance arise within their heart that they are a child of God, that you will bless them in that way. Lord, many of us, We've known this truth for a long time. Help us to share it with others. Destruction is coming, but it doesn't have to be. Lord, help us to share that they can avoid it. They can escape it. Not by what they do, but by accepting what Christ has done. Lord, we pray for a rival in America. And start it with us, sharing our faith, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.